Thank you so much for being back with us on another episode of Winning the Moment. Today, I've got a great guest. His name is Tony Christensen, and he is the founding partner of Stratera Wealth Management. And I think I ask one question, and then we just blaze a trail from there. It's absolutely entertaining. You're going to love it. Be sure to like and subscribe. And most importantly, enjoy the episode. Wherever you are and however you are listening, thank you so much for being back with us on another episode of Winning the Moment. Today, I have Tony Christensen. He is the founding partner at Stratera Wealth Management. Tony, thanks for being here. Hey, it's great to be here. Thanks for having me. Uh, wealth management is something I've always been fascinated with. In fact, I took my first ever meeting with you when I was like pursuing a career. Uh, my parents were not great with money, so that's where my desire to do it came from. You know, like I... When I was 18, I was like, no one ever taught me about money. So I bought all the books that I could on finance. And so I'm curious, like, what made you want to be in that space? Yeah, um, man, that's a great question. So probably, you know, it probably, it probably stems as like a kid, right? Like yeah. You get all these kind of weird beliefs about money specifically and whether it's good or bad. And so I think it started there sure. uh, at a young age. Um, and I always was that kid like... You know, if my parents gave me 20 bucks for school lunch in high school or something, I'd spend 10 of it, right? Like I, I would save it because I just, I just naturally didn't want to spend what I had. I love that you just said that because my lunch allowance for a week in school was also $20. Yeah. And I could get a bagel and cream cheese for $1. This is this before by inflation, right? And so I could get a bagel and cream cheese for a dollar. So I could spend $5 on lunch. And then I'd have fifteen dollars to like do something with. Totally, totally. And I, I, I still remember like, uh, you know, Wendy's was the place to go because you could get yeah. a junior bacon cheeseburger for a dollar. Right? Yeah. So I got I get two of those a day, and I, I I'm good. Two yeah. bucks, I'm, I'm golden. But I, um, I had like some some pretty unique experiences, uh, like early on in in uh, like pre marriage. Okay. Um, so in college. And so like I, I got home from an LDS mission in 2007 and. Oh, right before. Like what a hard time to start being an adult. Yeah. So it's kind of, it kind of, kind of a funny, a funny time, but you know, like this is when I knew like I had the entrepreneurial spirit. Yeah. Um, so I've always had this love for cars, right? I just always loved cars. And, um, and when I got home, I had found out that my parents had, had put aside some money for me, which I was like, man. Like we weren't like super wealthy by any means. So sure. I, I was just super grateful that they did anything. Yeah. I, I didn't expect anything. And so I heard from a friend of a friend that he was like buying wrecked cars that didn't have a salvaged title. And then he would fix them up and sell them. Okay. And, well, he did this until he had like this massive dealership, right? And so, you know, being young and naive and thinking I could take over the world at the time, I'm like, oh dude, I could do that. So I so I went to my parents and I'm like, hey, can I can I use that money you set aside to like start trying this? So I buy my first, it was a 2006 Volkswagen Jetta and it's wrecked. I, so I found out where he got the car. Okay. From. So it is wrecked when you buy it. Yep. So, so this is a little bit of a long story that I'll try to shorten. Oh no, this is a great story. I'm, I'm fascinated. So, so I buy this 2006 Volkswagen Jetta um, and, and my numbers are going to be off, right? This is off sure. memory. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I think almost 20 years ago now. Yeah. Yeah. So I think, I think my parents probably put aside, like, it was probably like $8,000, which that was a lot of money. Yeah, for sure. You know? It's significant. And so, uh, my first car that I bought that Jetta, the wreck Jetta, um, was once again, off the top of my head, I think it was like seven ish thousand. Wrecked. Okay. So I've got a little bit of money left, right? Yeah. but I have a whole lot car of stuff I got to build fix. out. Yeah. So I don't have enough money for that either. Right. So then I go back to my dad and I'm like, hey, yeah, Dad, so this is a little bit more expensive than I anticipated. <laughs> uh, can I use a company credit card? Uh, he's a small business owner, HVAC company. Yeah. Like, he really shouldn't be doing this for me, right? Like, yeah. He's just, like, my parents are so awesome. So I, I wish I could, like, go back and, like, record his face or remember the discussion yeah. I had. I just don't know. Yeah. But I'm like, can I use your credit card to, like, buy all the parts that I need to put this car together and to pay the guy to put it together and, you know, all yeah. these things. So I finally finished this car, like 
this is months and just tons of headache. And some of it, me and my dad did. Most of it, I paid this guy to do. It's finally finished. And I'm like, oh, dude, this car is sweet. Like, it's a super cool car at the time. Yeah. And I'm like, I'm just going to drive it for one week just to enjoy it before I sell it. Because I got to pay my dad's yeah. credit cards off, yeah. right? Like, I, yeah. there's all sorts of stuff. Well, I'm driving down the freeway. It makes this noise. I take it into like the only guy that works on that type of car in St. George yeah. at that time. I was going to say in 2006, there's probably one. Yeah, yeah that's right. Uh huh. And he was like, uh, dude, you need, you need to go to a Volkswagen dealer. So and we don't have one at the time. So I take it to Vegas. And were you able to drive it to Vegas? Yes. Okay. And it, and it just would occasionally make this noise that literally sounded like the car was just going to explode. And I'm like, <laughs> please don't explode. Please don't explode. <laughs> so I get down there and, you know, they have that appointment. I, so they check on it. I go back and they say, Tony, like, what on earth is this thing? Right. And I'm like, uh, I, like, what do you mean? And they're like, this thing is like, <laughs> I don't know who put this together, but this is like the craziest car. It's just like patched together everywhere underneath, you know? And I'm like, well, this is what I did, you know? <laughs> and and they say, they're like, so here's the problem. Like, it literally kind of reminds us of, like, the wiring harness on the front end of this 2006 Volks- Volkswagen Jetta looks like it was, like, put together with, like, wiring nuts that you'd use in your house. And I'm like, eh, yeah, that's kind of how we did it, you know? <laughs> and he's like, well, here's the problem. Uh, you, we think it needs a whole new wiring harness and that wiring harness is like, I think off the top of my head, I think it was like four or $5,000. Oh my gosh. And they said, the problem is we, we can't promise it's going to fix it. We're just not sure until that gets fixed first. So anyway, I, so now I'm like, I'm in this like really crappy spot. Yeah. I, I'm just, I just got home from a mission. I don't like, I don't, I haven't really like taken on full responsibility for my life yet. Sure. Right. Yeah. And, and I'm sitting there and I'm thinking, gosh, dude, my parents like save this money for me. I've got it in this car and now I'm in debt in credit cards that are not low interest on my dad's name. Yeah. And now I have to make this like gamble of spending another, you know, four grand to, to, to try this. It's so great to hear this because you forget all of those like trials and tribulations of like young adulthood. Totally. It was in your life now. It's like, that's not even... You just don't think about it. Right. So to like go back and and think about those things you do to try and make it your way, it's it's fascinating. So you're at the dealership, four grand to get the rewiring. So you know, I I just realized like in that moment, like I don't have the stomach for it. I just because because what if I spend it and it doesn't fix it, and now I'm deeper yeah. into this hole. Yeah. So what was the car worth at the time? So if it was finished and done off the top of my head, I think it should have sold for like 17, 18. Okay, so you were sitting in there. good. Yeah, yeah. So I should have been fine. Um, I ended up trading it in. Uh, and once again, I'm going to... I think... I know the net result of yeah. all this, but I think I traded it in for like... I think they gave me nine or 10 grand. So you got everything back out of it. So, so what it ended up being was... So I took my... The hard-earned money that my yeah. parents had set aside for me, like eight thousand. <laughs> yeah. When everything was said and done, and I paid my dad off for all the stuff, I think I ended up with like fifteen hundred bucks, or like two grand. To the good. To no, 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 no. Oh. Total. Meaning, so I lost. <laughs> oh. So because I'm a genius, <laughs> so you right? lost six grand. Yeah. I so like <laughs> so my first like out of the gate experience with life and like trying to be an entrepreneur and I'm so smart is. Like, I lose 75% of the money I was given. Do you right? think you thought you were smart at that time? Like, were you like, oh, I'm a smart kid? Oh, yeah, dude. Yeah. I was I was so overconfident. So <laughs> overconfident. So arrogant. And uh, um, Did the mission make you more or less confident? So I would say, I would say the mission made me way more confident. And then that kind of morphed into like, like when I got home, I, th- I think it kind of took on its own form of arrogance is sure. what happened. Yeah. But um, I, I wish I could say like that experience was the one, but I have like multiple. I mean, I have two more, like yeah. immediately back to back. Let, let me let me tell you why this is so important. Because I, I was just at uh, Utah Tech had their job there today, so we were there representing one of the companies, uh, trying to help young people find us and and create opportunities for them. And I'm sitting with our HR director. Her name's Cam. 
and we're talking about the podcast because I hadn't really ever got to know her yet. And so we're going to get to know each other. And she's like, tell me about the podcast. And so I'm talking about all the different people. And I'm like, but I'll tell you what people love is struggle. Because if I bring someone on and all they talk about is like, yep, I succeeded here and then I succeeded here and then I succeeded here. No one really wants to hear that. But someone right now has $8,000 of debt that they're like, how did I, how did I get here? And they're, in fact, you just reminded me of one that I'll tell after you're done, uh, that I completely forgot about until just this moment. Um, (laughs) but that's what people need because someone's in that struggle right now. And so then they see you on the other side of it and it's like, okay, it's not forever. It's just what I'm going through right now. And that's what gives you the skills to be a good business person, right? Because you've got to understand where you were weak and where you failed. So I can't wait to hear what the next one is. You got two more. Yeah. And yeah, I mean, to your to your point, I, uh, you know, you definitely learn the most from like the craziest experiences of your life, right? And uh, once again, I, I so I so I finished that and, you know, I'm, I'm pretty like, bummed but i am far from depressed like i am like (laughs) well i gotta go make it back you know like that's essentially what was going through and so you're you're at that time like what uh 20 ish 21 so i'm just about to get married so i'm 21 i'm almost 22 okay when all this goes down did you have a job during all of this uh no you're just going to school yeah well i meaning meaning i at that time i had just started uh, I had just started selling window washing for my buddy Skyler Topham. Okay. So I don't know if you know Skyler. I know Sky. I don't know him like personally, but I remember he hit the game winner against Dixie High School. Yes. Yeah, dude. <laughs> and this is the yeah. second time he's been brought up on the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So That's you funny. went to Pineview. When did you graduate? Oh, four. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so, so at that time, uh, so we get married. Uh, my wife Lindsay, and uh, and so she kind of went through this roller coaster with me, and I and I'm sure like her parents were like, "Who is this? This guy's dude? an idiot." Yes, like, like he is all over the board. Yeah, and and I still think back to that, right? Because I'm always thinking about my own my own girls. And yeah, I'm like don't you marry some dork? Yeah. <laughs> like you know, yeah. and and so, uh, so at that time, and maybe you remember this, but when you first get married and you really don't show a lot of income. You you qualify for FAFSA, FAFSA. FAFSA. That's like a school thing, right? Yeah, it's 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 through the state of Utah. Okay, yeah. yeah. I didn't uh, I didn't ever go to school, so I. Okay. I didn't. And, and I, I'm pretty sure it's only school thing. I think. I'm yeah, not I think if you're married and in school, they give you money. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, because someone else on the podcast, Will Rogers, that's how him and his wife survived in the beginning. Okay. So so same thing. My wife and I were extremely frugal with everything, and so when we got that money. That was excess, right? Yeah. And we both had scholarships. And so I was like, well, look, I just got my next tranche of money. I'm going to go And how much did use. you get? Uh, off the top of my head, I think it was like five to 8000 Holy I feel shit. Like. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. significant. I, I think it was a decent amount. Yeah. yeah. So um, I'm taking finance courses at this time. And and you you know you play the stock market game. Oh, sure. Like the paper stocks. Yeah. 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 So it's just not, a, it's not real, yeah. right? And you... you and you play this game in class, and like you rank, you know, at the end of the at the end of the semester, who has the most money in the, yeah. in the game? Well, uh, you know, I ended up taking second, and once again, I'm like, this is easy, man. It's like yeah. the easiest money. Like, there's, I could totally do this with real money. Yeah. So what do I do? It's funny too because you actually could because yeah. it, it is the real stock it, market. It, it, it's it, just not real money. Yes. Yes. <laughs> so I take the FAFSA money and, uh. Long story short, like my first day of day trading. Oh, you were trying to day trade. You yeah. weren't even trying to like nope. long play anything. No, nope. it was all daily trading. And my first, uh, my first day, I remember I made three hundred bucks. And I'm like, dude, hun, I made three hundred bucks today. Well, I don't even need a job. Like, yeah. I do this every day. No big deal. <laughs> and and no joke, it was the next week that. I was in class and I would sit in the back so that I could have my computer open so that I could see like yeah. what was happening yeah. on those positions. I only had one position at the time and it was so crazy, Cody, because there was a there's a professor named Dr. Wells and he is talking about why it is so hard to make money 
day trading. Like he's like this is a full discussion in class. And you're watching your day trading. And I'm doing it as he's saying it's literally close to impossible to really do it well. Yeah. And he even has these funny verbs that he or funny phrases he uses for people who try. And that discussion lasts about 45 minutes. And in that 45 minute period of time, it just so happened that my main holding, the company decided to file for bankruptcy unannounced to me. And it was just, it was essentially just tanking. So I ended up taking my, and I didn't have a ton in there. I only put, I had $2,300 in there. So okay. I'd only, I invested 2000 I was up 300 right? Yeah. So 2300 bucks was in this one thing. And by the time that class was over, I think I had 350 bucks. <laughs> <laughs> and and this is the best part. Like, I sell because I'm like, I don't know what the future of that company is. Yeah. And then, do, you know, I, I don't get back into that game, right? So yeah. I just, I, I end up just losing a big chunk of our FAFSA money now, right? So I lose all this money. I my can't believe you lost me. it while someone's teaching a class on not doing it. It's just fascinating. What like, a great story. Who would have thought you'd be a successful advisor after so that? So crazy, right? <laughs> uh, yeah. And what did your wife think? Uh, dude, my wife was so, so cool about it all. Like she, it's just like, she honestly, she didn't have an opinion. Like she just was. She just believed in you long term. Yeah. Like she's been. She wasn't day trading. She was, she, you were a long term investment. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. Serious. She, she actually had a regular job yeah. making 11 bucks an hour and that's how we survived. Like, oh just, man. Just like getting it all figured out. But isn't it crazy to think that there was a time when a married woman was helping her family live and she got eleven dollars an hour? Yeah. Now McDonald's is, starts at seventeen dollars an hour. So crazy, so crazy. It really is. Yeah, and and, and I, I think I still go back to this idea of like. So you know, I had I had a, I had one more big story that I won't I won't share, but um, but I think back on like the first few big experiences I had as like my own personal responsible adult. Yeah. And, and my nature for like entrepreneurship and business. And, and that was like the catalyst to everything. Right. Yeah. Cause 'cause I went through the next one I went through, I I had someone that, that, um, that was threatening to sue me. And I realized I didn't have a stomach for that at all. Zero. I did not want to deal with the law. Like, yeah, period. And, um, and it was something silly, like looking back, I'm like, I can't believe that that scared me that much. But just the thought of anyone sure. thinking about suing yeah. me just put me out. So I think back on those experiences and I just realized like, you know, money's like money has a lot of emotional things. Oh, it's so to important it. to understand your, your, uh, emotional relationship to money Yeah, before you, before you really do anything, because how you feel about money emotionally is going to completely change advice I'd give someone. Totally, totally. Yeah, and 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 so it ended up just, it was like kind of this catalyst of like, man, I don't want other people to experience what I went through. Like yeah. I learned some lessons there about yeah. money and about emotion. And is there a job that like helps people avoid this stuff? Like does this stuff? That's right? how it came together. That's That was kind of the final coming together moment. There was some other things. But, but... did you already, because you got your degree in business and finance, right? From yeah. Dixie State. And so you already knew you, you liked that space. But mm-hmm. then these things is what shaped you to like, I want to help give individuals direction. Yeah, yeah. Because it started out, I was probably going the corporate side. Like I, yeah. I, I saw myself more as like a controller, okay. you know, for a company or something. Yeah. And that was kind of the, you know, those experiences were like the catalyst to like, no, I think I want to help individuals, like people. So that's kind of how that all. That's came the best about. answer to the to my leading question I could have ever got. You know, <laughs> like that was so much more entertaining than what I thought you were going to say. Uh, okay, so I'll share two. The first one was I think it was with Rick Entz, and it was called Money Mastery for Life. Did you ever hear about that? Oh yeah. <laughs> and so we go in. Uh, my friend Danny Loveland comes and gets me. He's like, dude. Like this guy's got it together, like this awesome program. And I love money and I'm like reading the books. And so, and there was a great book that was a part of Money Mastery for Life. And it was like a, a, a CD disc set, like you put in your computer and had like courses and had like a module. Ultimately it was a multi-level marketing scam, but they're like, it was built on something cool. So I take me and my girlfriend, who's my wife now, you know, we go to the presentation and they're like, I think it's $1,600 to start. 
but you guys are at the top of the pyramid, you know, like you, and if you get people below you and he was doing like some guarantee where it's like, if you don't think it works an X amount of time, like we'll give you your money back. So my wife and I were like, yeah, duh, you know, and we don't even have any money. It's like, we both like paid on a credit card, you know, for both of us. And I was like, and then I started getting like some checks or something. Like I started to receive the payments because I think it was really a Ponzi scheme more than like multi-level marketing. So then I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm signing my dad up. I'm signing my aunt up. My wife signed up her mom and her <laughs> sister. And we paid for it. Yeah, yeah. We do not have any money. Yeah. Right. We do not have money. And you only got back, it was like 1600 but I think you got back like a thousand of it went to the money mastery and 600 went to like the, the business or whatever. And so that's the part you could get back. And so we fought to get all of our 600s back, you know, and I was like diligent. Like I would show up to that office every day on the boulevard, like, is our checks ready? Is our checks ready? So I think we invested uh, to save the audience having to listen to me think. I think we each paid for three people. So we spent $9,600. We had no money. Oh my gosh. Right? We had no money. 600 times three. So we got 1,800. No, 600 times six. So then we got 3,600 back. And so, you know, we're in the hole pretty deep. And, (laughs) (laughs) and, and I don't know why we thought it was going to work. Anything that takes no work is not going to work. You know, I even bought like the email or didn't buy it. I sent up for the email, like money mastery for life at hotmail.com. I like made business cards. I remember telling my mother-in-law like, yeah, this is it. Like we're doing it, you know? So legit. So I was so hardcore believing into it. And so we had uh, two Yorkies uh, puppies and my wife had bought one on a credit card because we were stupid. And it was like $1,400, like 17 years ago. So it's like a $3,000 dog today and didn't have any money. And luckily our friend bought his girlfriend, a Yorkie, a girl that they ended up not liking or not wanting for some reason. I can't remember. They couldn't do it. So they gave it to her for, for us to for free. And then we bred those Yorkies when they got of the appropriate age and Thank Lord that Yorkie blessed us with eight beautiful puppies, <laughs> which a Yorkie is not supposed to have. <laughs> and that's how we got out of debt. Oh, my God. Yep. So that was that was one of them. Then the other one, which is equally egregious. My, do you remember Micah Pilkey? Did you ever know who Micah Pilkey was? I don't think so. Uh, just a full scammer. Like, uh, you ever see the show White Collar? Uh-huh. He's like that guy. Mm. Like, he is actually brilliant. He just decided to take all of his ingenuity And put it into scams, you know? So he comes to me one day and like, he'd already been in trouble with the law and like it burned all of the different people and different things. He was like, dude, uh, there's this Lamborghini for sale in Texas and I can go buy it. And if I get it, then we can sell it for X amount and I'll give you 10 grand, but I'm on probation. So I can't leave the state. (laughs) He was like, so they're like, I have to use your credit card to like pay for everything to get there. Oh my gosh. And I'm like, no, dude. He was like, I promise I will come back. You will get 10 grand. And at this time, I own my cell phone store on the boulevard called The Cell Phone Guy. And I'm not making any money because I have to put all the money back into the business. I'm working six days a week, open to close. And then I go out to Tuacon at night, Monday through Friday. And I have this big wheel and I spin it. And it, if it hit the winner, then the kids got like one of those big boxes of candy. And I was getting their parents to go to a timeshare with Wyndham Vacations. Mm-hmm. And everyone that signed up, I got 70 bucks and I'd usually get three a night. Right. So that's $210 a night. And that's what I lived off of. Oh my God. And then all the money for the business was going back to the business. So needless to say, I needed some money. So I'm like, I don't know. He's like, I promise. And so I make him go to uh, the bank with me and we get a contract and I have him sign uh, like a notary, sign a promissory note. Cause I'm like, I'm doing it all above board, you know? So, and I have, and what's so great is I have a map of the United States in my cell phone store because I have like the coverage map, you know? So I'll call him like, where are you at? And he's like, I'm in Oklahoma. And I'm like looking at the map, like, is he fucking lying to me? You know? (laughs) And so he comes back a week later, walks into my office and gives me $10,000 cash. And he's like, told you. Oh my God. And I'm like, holy shit. Like at that point for me in my life, it may as well have been a hundred thousand dollars because I don't know what my future is. I'm living at home with my parents. I'm working, you know, from nine until nine every day. Like it's, I'm not, I have no, no real belief that things are going to work out. So this Mm -hmm. 10 grand is like, 
I can breathe, you know, like it's all going to be okay. First time I felt like I'd really had money in my adult life. And so then he comes back a little bit later. He's like, Hey dude, opportunity to flip that money, hard money loan guy needs X. And then you're going to get this. And he's like, and so then you're going to have that. And I was like, okay. And now I'm like, I believe him again. So I just give him the 10 grand, you know? And I think I grew it to like $30,000 no that way. I had. So I'm feeling like I am just balling oh, yeah. out of control, you know? Totally. Hadn't told my dad or anything yet. And then one night my dad's like, we're talking about something. I was like, oh, dad, I got to tell you. I pull up my bank account and I'm like, look at this. And he's like, where did you get all that money, you know? <laughs> and so I tell him and he's like, well, is there any other opportunity? And I was like, I don't know. I'll ask, you know? So Micah has another one for us. And so now I give him all of my cash and then I cash advance my credit cards, like 30 grand. So I can give him like 60, you know, and then my dad cash advances his credit card. So we give him like $90,000 and that was the one that got us. And so he never, so ended up being a Ponzi scheme. And so I never got that money back. So not only did I lose the cash that I had, I leveraged all these credit cards. And so I was just like, I mean, that was the most depressed in my life I'd ever been. I can remember uh, the only time I wasn't depressed, there was a show called Robin Big back in the day. Mm -hmm. And that 30 minutes was like the only thing I could watch that would like let me feel like a regular because I woke up every day and I would call Mike and be like, where's the money? And then he gave me checks that bounced and he would write me a check and I'd go to the bank and I'd be like, the bank where the check came from because I bounced the other one. I'm like, oh, there's not enough funds. And he's like, oh, I just got to cash out this CD. So I'm spending every day calling, stressing. And now it's one thing that I screwed myself. But now I screwed my dad who doesn't even have any money anyways. You know, like he wasn't Mm -hmm. even in a position to lose it. And then funny story, I, I ended up meeting this guy who was also a part of it. And he was like, he comes into Costco where I'm working. He's like, oh, yeah, I picked that little bitch up, put him in my van, stuck his finger in a cigar cutter. And I said, give me my money or I'm cutting your finger off. Oh, my God. Yeah. I mean, it got like and I even think he went to his mom's office and like someone got on her desk with like a pistol. And so he did, in fact, get his money. Uh, I oh, did not. Oh, my God. And so then like we went to court and everything and I got restitution like I won the court. And so I would get checks and, uh, you know, like I'd get one hundred and eighty dollars here. $400 there. And one day I get like a letter saying like restitution is complete. So I call the court and I'm like, Hey, I just got this letter. It says restitution is complete. He owes me like $30,000. I've gotten like 1200. Like, yeah, I know. But the time has lapsed. And I was like, it's not, no, it's not, <laughs> it's not a time situation. Uh, uh, not, uh, uh, let, no, no, that's <laughs> not how it works. It's a money situation. I was like, he can pay his whole life. I don't care. Oh my God. But he still owes to me like, no, yeah, the, the time round. I'm like, well, that's the dumbest. That's literally the dumbest thing I've ever heard. You're incentivizing him to not do it because he only had like two years. And so that took a long, that was one of those things that like took a long time to get over, you know, and luckily I ended up getting into a good career and finding success. And so I was able to put it all behind me. I sold my business, but uh, there was definitely a time there where I felt like kind of like you, Mm -hmm. you know, like I really, I ruined my life. Yeah. Yeah. Isn't it, isn't it like so fascinating that they, and and it really is like a real principle. Yeah. The the principle that like, when you think you're at rock bottom, Mm -hmm. you're about to break through to the best part of your life. Yeah. Right. And but man, does it not feel that way in the moment? Oh, in the moment, dude. I mean, it was bad. I mean, I'm not a depressed person. I don't feel like I struggle with depression in any capacity. But in that moment of time, I mean, nothing made me happy because I just felt like and money for me emotionally did represent happiness at that time in my life, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. and so not only losing it, but then losing money I didn't even have to lose. And not knowing what my path out was and like being in my relationship with my wife now, Megan, like, God, how are we going to even like, like I bet in that time, I felt like I ruined my chances of even having a family. Mm -hmm. Like I'm so stupid. Yeah, no kids. And we don't even, I live at my house and she has her parents' house, but still just like my future is worthless. Like I'm an idiot, you know? Uh, And Cody Sanchez, uh, really successful a uh, businesswoman, great thought leader. She, I read a tweet. She said today that I've never met anyone truly successful who hasn't almost or lost everything at some point in their life. 
And it's very true. I look back on those moments in my life now, so thankful for the lessons that they taught me. Mm-hmm. You know, like that's the education that I paid for, you know, and I and it cost me a bunch of money. But I think I learned so much more than I would have spending that money on a plethora of other things that I could have done. For sure. For sure. Is uh, out of curiosity, like uh, how did you grow up? financially and, and sorry if you've no, covered this on yeah a podcast. that's a great I'm question sure. uh so that because obviously that's important because it shapes how you are with money right and so my parents when i was younger were both teachers so very like stable simple flat income right so it's like there are no ups and downs it just is what it is uh and my my wife's uh sisters and brothers were really successful they're like principals so they made more money and my other and her brother was an entrepreneur owned gas stations and car washes and so, like, they, when we'd go camping, they'd be in their nice motorhomes, like, we'd be in a tent. And that never bothered me. And, like, my dad always found ways, and I don't know what they were because I'm too young, but, like, we did have a Porsche, and, like, my mom had a BMW, and I know they were used. I thought they were awesome, but maybe they have, like, 100,000 miles or something. Like, yeah. I don't know yeah. that part of mm-hmm. it, right? But I remember thinking we had cool cars, and we lived in a really nice neighborhood. So I always felt at that this is like fourth, fifth grade, like, oh, we're doing really good, you know? And then my dad um, started working for my mom's brother and he helped build a car wash and like got in, got in the entrepreneur space. And then someone recruited him to go sell uh, uh, this like new car wash, like soap and stuff. Mm-hmm. And he said it was the worst job he ever had. Like he had a district in Colorado. He said he would drive his truck there and just sit there and wait all day and come home like he was in a bad way. So that company fired him, obviously, because he didn't do anything. And I can remember that's when I started to realize is the first time ever in my life. So I'm probably 10 to 12 where I was like, oh, it's like shit's bad. Like, I'm not going to ask for anything. I'm not going to ask for the toy. I'm not going to ask for anything. And I, he, I'd seen him cry two times in his life at that point when his best friend died. It was our principal. And when he'd gone to a job interview, that was like so terrible. And like he didn't, he wasn't working, you know? And so then uh, our parents or our, his really good friend's brother was selling a franchise, Mary Maid. So it was like people who cleaned your house. Mm-hmm. And my dad bought that. And that's when I got to see what entrepreneurship does. And then our life got like really good, but it was very up and down. Gotcha. So then he bought a franchise in like Corpus Christi and then he bought one in St. George. And that's how we got here. And so Which, how old are you this time now? So when he bought the one in St. George, I was a freshman in high school. Okay. And he said to me, like, do you uh, want to move? Cause you're in high school. So like, it's totally up to you. And I was like, yeah, like, yeah, I'll do it. Sounds awesome. Like palm trees and warm weather. Like, yes. So we moved to St. George and it was really successful during that time. And so all of my high school life, like it was, I felt really good. I felt um, like we had money. I felt really good about it. It wasn't until I was older and could start to see things that I realized like it was leverage and credit cards and bad purchases. And we had, we'd gotten this house in St. George, like 177,000 redid it. So we made it really nice. But then my mom wanted to be in the nicer neighborhood where all of the other lady friends were. So then they got a house that was more than they could afford and had all the cars and all of the things. And I would then start to hear the conversations. And that's when I realized like they have no understanding of money nor do they have any plan for the future and that's when i got in the financial books when i realized like they're literally their financial plan is like just literally day by day Mm -hmm. never set anything aside never had savings and i remember like even times because this was like when you'd have cash and you'd have like a thousand dollars on at any moment so i i kind of felt like we were rich when i was a little kid but then as i started to understand money as i got older that's when i saw the pitfalls of like all the poor decisions they were making so true, man. It's, uh, it, it's, it's wild to, you know, through all those experiences you had, right? Like that totally yeah. shapes how you view everything now and, and, and maybe how you, a hundred percent, you know, the reasons why you've, you've been so successful. It, it, it's just funny. Cause I feel like I have these conversations with my buddies yeah, and, and we're always like, trying to steer right we're always trying to be really intentional with our kids yo about i had what that life conversation like today them, right yeah and it's like man we got to be careful because maybe the very reason that we are who we are is because we were let the chance to just be you know yeah. like yeah we just 
things just happened. We got to learn and see and observe. Well, and I think even to that point, so I was talking to Cam today at that conference about my children, right? Because she was asking about my story. Which, remind me how many? Uh, two. two. Uh, my son's seven and my daughter's 11. Okay. And so I remember we grew up in Cheyenne, Wyoming. So we'd go to Nuggets games. We'd get like a 10-game package. It was like two hours north of us or south, I guess. And I remember going to the games with my dad and I would look at the box seats and I was like, one day I'm going to sit in one of those boxes. Like, that's what I want to do, you know? And for the last three years, we've had season tickets to the jazz and the box seats. And so my kids have only been to games and box seats. And I'm like, man, it, I love that I'm doing that for them. Like, it brings me such joy to do mm-hmm. these amazing things for my children. But on the same token, my son's not sitting there being like one day. He's just like, this is awesome. Like, this is this is where I sit, mm-hmm. you know? And so am I in my desire to give him all the things Am I stunting his ability to have a desire for more? And But how do you handle that as a parent? Because I don't want to take things away from them. Totally, totally. We we just had this, uh, we just had this conversation where uh, I, think, I think a lot of us are in the same boat where, you know, there was something that you wanted as a kid or that you wanted different or, yeah. and, and so, and so we have to be, we almost have to own it at this stage knowing the consequences that it might have on our kids. Yeah. Right. And, and if we don't like those consequences, we might have to give up on some of the things we want. And that's like, it's a really hard balance. Yeah. I don't know the answer. I yeah. have no idea, but that's the conversation. Of it's like, tough. I, I don't, I, I, you know, uh, uh, a friend of mine is just like, I just, there, I, I felt so deprived as a kid that I just want what I want now. And yeah, and unfortunate. Yeah. The unfortunate reality is that also means my kids get these things, and and I've decided that I'm just okay with it, and I just hope it doesn't ruin them. You know? Yeah, and I think it's not going to ruin them, right? But it is the like, and that's why these eighty percent of second generation businesses fail. Because if you built the business, you have a different work ethic and you had all those stories that we shared of like failure and adversity. And then when you're the second generation and you're just helping the business succeed, you already are like, oh, it's December and we need a tax deduction. So you get a new truck like you're already in that space. Right. And so then it's so much harder for that generation to succeed once the first generation leaves. 80 totally. percent of the time it fails. Right. Yeah. And so I'm, I'm thinking about like, how can I. How can I take what this 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 really fortunate life I've built and use that for good for my kids? So what I'm thinking about doing right now is I want to buy each of my kids a service business, window washing, power washing, auto detailing, something that, you know, you can get into for a low barrier to entry. And then that's where they're going to work. Like that will be their job, you know, from 13 to 18. So they're five years. They get to work in this company. And then at 18, it's like, okay, now it's your business. And the whole way I'm going to show them their P&Ls and their financial statements. And it's like, you can now run it yourself and get rid of the manager who's been running it for five years, or you can keep the manager and have it like take your distributions if you're, if you're successful or Mm -hmm. you can build a branch and, and Cedar. Like, I don't, I'm not trying to determine what their life's going to be, but just give them a tool to have a place where they go work. And it's not like, oh, I'm going to Harkins or I'm just going to the movie theater. It's like, no, you're going to work for your company, but you got to do all the shitty jobs totally for five years until you know how to do it. And then you get to make an, a real adult decision. What does that look like? Yeah. And so I think that's that's kind of where I've landed of how can I take this good opportunity we're in and not spoil them, but give them something where they can learn and build and learn the skill sets totally. that I want them to learn. Yeah. Yeah. We have... Uh... Uh, my wife and I, uh, we implemented this whole new system in our family, uh, using a system called, have you heard of green light? No. So it's just like a, it's an app for, okay. for kids. Okay. But, but the way that, that, that we've kind of built this system is like our kids have certain things that they have to do every week. And so they're chores. Yep. We'll call them chores. And those chores, as long as they get done, they have a base We'll, we'll call it a base allowance that they get each week. Now, some people think, some people hate the idea that kids get paid for allowances, and I get it. I, I understand I love there. It. Did I you get it there. as a kid? No, I did. Okay, so I had a I had a star sheet that I had to like okay. get so many. I get like twenty six stars, and I got 
I don't remember how much money, but I loved it because I liked working for money that mm-hmm. then I could. So what I would do is I would buy Jordans and I'd resell them. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Which but I, I, such I, a cool experience. I needed money to be able to do that. Yeah. Yeah, totally. And, and what we, what we've noticed is like, so like, man, I mean, you always got to stop at Maverick, right? It's adventure's yeah. first stop when you're leaving yeah. town every day. You know? <laughs> if you want to go on an adventure, I mean, you do. I mean, that's just what we do. <laughs> yeah. So, so we're always at Maverick, right? Because we're always going on an adventure as a family. And, uh, and what we noticed is like, dude, we're buying all this stuff at the dang grocery, at the dang gas station when we're headed out on a, on an adventure, Yeah, like all the time. And you're just paying more. And for we're it. just paying for it. Yeah. And I'm like, how cool would it be to give our kids the opportunity to make these decisions at an early age Yeah, and to, to live with the consequences. So what's so fun, like what's been crazy to me is watching all three of my kids and how they react completely different. Yeah. It's to fascinating. Money. Yeah. So like my son is the king of, nah, dad, I'm broke. Like he will just say, nah, I'm broke. Like he just, he knows he spent all of his money. Yeah. My other two girls, it's like super savers. They, they, their bank accounts just continue to fill and they just don't spend it. But it's so funny to me to just see them all be so completely different as it relates to money. Like, and, and the other thing too is my son, like he actually, he dreams about these things. You know, he's like, oh dad, dude, no, I'm saving for this now. I'm saving for that now. And he legitimately will save. And the second he has enough, it's gone. Like he he's buys that thing, thing. he wants. It's here. Yeah. And, and my, but I just love the fact that if I go to a store or we're around somewhere and, and they're like, you know, I really want this. I get to ask the question, do you have money for that? Yeah. No, I love it. I and, think it's so important to let kids understand the value of money. Yeah. Because otherwise they have no perception. Nothing. Right? Like if you're just buying a Lego set for them, that's $27. That doesn't mean anything to them if they don't even know like, well, what? So what I do is, I don't know, I should do allowance, but I just have, I've yet to do it and shame on me. But if my kids want something, I'll be like, well. Can rub my feet, you know. Yeah, yeah. Dollar totally. a minute, you yeah. know. Like you can buy it that way, because then they're like, "Oh, do I really want that thing?" And for like Halloween, we bought their candy from them because we didn't want them to have all that candy. My daughter, I believe she saved her money, but my son knew, just like your son, he was. There's a helicopter for thirty dollars at Target that like you can fly. Mm-hmm. He's like, "That's what I want," and he bought it and he broke it in one day because he that's what he always does, mm-hmm. and he's like. Yeah, but it was still fun. Like, I got $30 worth of entertainment out of it, you know? And it's like, okay, if that's, I mean, if that's what you think, you know, like, that that's your that's your belief of money. Totally. But, man, I sure do want to instill those principles. And, and I hope, you know, I'm at the very beginning stage of the service industry thing. Like, I just thought about it. I've just started looking for businesses that are for sale. But I hope in doing that, it's like, I was thinking, they're getting to the age where they could start to work, but I want that work to have purpose and value. And not just like, oh, I'm going and I'm, I'm going to begrudgingly stand at the snack bar at the movie theater. Mm-hmm. But like, mm-hmm. oh, I'm actually learning a skill. And if I can perfect this skill, then when I turn 18, because any good service business within five years are going to be making, you know, at six figures plus. And so then it's like they can graduate and mm-hmm. have this vehicle to create a life for themselves. Totally. Totally. So we'll see. It's it's uh it's been it's been kind of fascinating for me as well. Just, you know, I've been doing the same thing now for over 15 years. So yeah. Cause you started in 2009, 2009 right? Yeah. And I, I think the thing that's been so like monumental to me is just, if you can get to a place in your life where money is always going to be a driver in things, like it will always be yeah. a part of our lives. But if you can disconnect from the concerns of money, Yep. Man, can you live a really purposeful, yeah. intentional, and impactful life, you know? And I think that's where, like, even in what we do every day, um, it is the most fulfilling thing for us is when we see our clients, like, live a really meaningful life, like, where they yeah. where they do the things that actually matter, yeah. and they're not worried about where they're going to make their next they're dollar. They're not a slave and, to their money. Yeah, it, because it just, money can... Money can be amazingly helpful or it can be just detrimental. It's really interesting because so my uh, my sisters are 27 and 24 and they are so removed 
from where I was at that time because I feel like things have changed so much. And I was telling uh, the gal I was working with today, I said, what's, what's so interesting is my sister, who's 24, Sarah, she was renting, she was sharing a two-bedroom apartment in Salt Lake, and her rent was $1,100. And I said, I built my first house when I was 20, and my mortgage was $1,100. So it's not even like from a financial standpoint that I was like kicking her ass, but my 1100 was so different than her 1100 mm-hmm. you know? Mm-hmm. And so it's like, I really wonder for that younger generation, like, I, I can't, do you have very many clients who are in that age bracket now that are in like their 20s? Not a ton. I wouldn't think so. But like, that's when we started, mm-hmm. you know? And so then not only are they not getting their houses and not building those foundations, but that compound interest is the most important thing. Right. For long term right. planning. Yeah. And yeah. they're missing a decade of it because mm-hmm. they're not even like they they couldn't even fathom like putting money away right now because they can barely survive. Yeah. So it's like they're literally missing that most important window to create that compound effect for themselves. Yeah. yeah. Uh, which which uh, it brings me to this this thing. This is kind of interesting. It, you know, a, a pretty common theme right now when it comes to money and and just how hard it is to live as a young couple, yeah, right? a newly married yeah. or young family. Um, but I'm seeing more and more. Uh, let's just let's just say parents like doing things right to help their their kids get a leg up right now. Okay, right? like their adult kids. Yes, and and I haven't decided how I feel about it yet. Probably because I'm not there, right? I don't yeah. have the kids in the yeah. situation, but I'd be super curious, like, like ha- ha- pros and cons. It's interesting because if you go back to my service industry thing for my kids, I'm, I want to buy this business, but I want them to work in it, right? Because if they didn't go to work, like, let's say I buy a power washing business for my son and he ends up being like, no, I don't like, I'm not going to do it. Well, then I, then you don't get the business, mm-hmm. right? Like you got to work in it mm-hmm. for five years and become the best power washer in the company. And then if you prove yourself and you take up and you take a liking to the business and you're invested in it, then, you know, then you can have it, but they'd have to earn it. I'll create the opportunity, but they'd have to earn it. And I think that I've had friends when I got married whose parents uh, like would give them 20 grand for like a down payment on a house. Like that was pretty common. I feel like amongst my friends, myself excluded. And I thought, well, that's cool because you know, they're, they're getting into ownership and that money isn't like going to frivolous stuff and they'll compound that money as they sell that house and they'll have more money to get into their next house. So I didn't, I didn't mind that. I mean, I have a whole life plan for each of my kids. Right. And so they're going to have 20 ish thousand dollars when they're, 18 that depending on what they want to do with it i'll give them the yes or no Mm -hmm, you know like mm -hmm. i'd let them put it towards the house i wouldn't let them buy a beat up volkswagen (laughs) (laughs) dude what if i what if i gave you the business plan dude (laughs) so i think you know i i've got that plan too to to create uh opportunity for them so i think it kind of depends what it is i think it depends on the kid like if the kid is not doing anything to improve their circumstance, then no, I don't think so. But if they're, I don't know, it's hard because it's your kid. You want to, you want to do the best for them. Yeah. Give me an example. Give me an example well, of what someone's done. Well, well, no. And I, I, meaning I think, I think, I think you're exactly right. I, I do think it's kid specific, right? I think yeah. our, our, our ability and, and the way we want to help each kid is going to be quite different. Even my example of my three kids and how yeah, sure. Beck is like, just he he's he's on a different spectrum when it comes to money, you know. Yeah. Um, but but I just I'm always curious. Uh, so I I deal with people like kind of at the different stage of life every day. Yeah. And so it's really fascinating to me to learn from them, to hear their experiences, to see what they are dealing with, and like what are the challenges that they face. And this is a big one for them, right? This is a big one where they're just trying to determine like how much should I help my adult kids and it's probably and, more and relevant families. now than it's ever been yes right because yes. i don't think that like those that, that examples i gave of families giving their kids twenty thousand dollars for a down payment on a house like they didn't the kids didn't need that they were just like here mm-hmm. but now it's like the kids like hey uh i can't afford our mortgage anymore and rent's gone up and groceries have gone up so like i like 
I'm going to be homeless or you can help pay my rent. Yeah. That's a different level of support, you know, because yeah. then it's like out of a necessity almost. It, it, it's so, it's so hard. I, um, I don't know if, I don't know if you're like this, but I always, I always think I believe a certain way until I like really think about it. Yeah. Right. Sure. And, and, and I'm like, I don't know. I don't know what I, what position I'd be in if my kids were, were even partially struggling, you know, cause I, I'm a pansy, especially for my girls. Well, dude. my dad said the same thing to me cause my one sister, sorry, Hannah, if you're listening, it's just what it is. So she's 27 and lives at home with my dad and has like no money and, and nothing to speak of, you know? And I'm like, dad, like you got to charge her rent because like how else you gonna learn? He's like, come see me when your daughter needs help, yeah, you know? Yeah. And I'm like, Oh, touche. <laughs> you know, but like, <laughs> all I can say is that, uh, so I bought the house when, so Meg and I moved to Arizona together. We were dating. We weren't married and I had the, a really good job. And so I bought the house when we were 20 or 21. I can't remember anymore, but we picked out the house together. Like we did it all together, but I bought it. And so I charged her rent as my girlfriend because I was like, look, I know how to manage money. I need to make sure you know how to manage money. <laughs> and so I didn't need the money, but I charged her 500 bucks a month for rent and I, and I paid for everything else. And so this was before Venmo. So she would literally like give me $500 cash every month. And I didn't need that cash. So I put it in a watch box. And then it came time to buy her wedding ring. And I was like, oh, (laughs) I happen to have all this cash. (laughs) So it's like she bought her wedding ring with her rent money. But that's kind of like I I think about that with my sister. It's like it's kind of uh, like when you have a a child that's struggling with addiction and you want to help them. But sometimes by helping them, you're hurting them, you know. And I kind of think of it that same way of like my dad not charging my sister rent is detrimental because it's allowing her to not have to want more. You know, if she mm-hmm. had to pay that rent or he said, I'm kicking you out, it would ha- it would create a drive in her. But she knows he's not going to kick her out. You know, he's not going to mm-hmm. kick his daughter out on the street. Right. right. But he, but how can he as he's 68 years old and my sister's 27. You know, how can he help her? in a way that's going to actually have a tangible benefit long term because i don't know i mean when you're 27 years old and you haven't figured out what your internal drive is yet i don't know that you can be helped mhm mhm well and, and even as we're talking i'm like oh my gosh you know like i mean i think about my parents giving me that money i couldn't have had those experiences without yeah. that coming yeah. through right, right. Like, i just wouldn't even have the op- the option wouldn't even yeah. be on the table and and I even think about uh, when we actually got married, my wife's parents also gave us some money and a car. And that money and that car, like, I mean, that was really, really helpful for us yeah. to get started, right? Yeah. It was like a little bit of a cushion there yeah, so that we could think straight so that I could, though, so that I could go and do a bunch of stuff and lose it all right <laughs> like I, get an I, education I, even even uh uh i still remember when we when we got married um uh i had to tell my wife like hey i uh uh so i didn't have i didn't have enough money so i so i had to get uh, I get, had to get a loan for your wedding ring, so we got to pay on that one. And uh, <laughs> that's great. So yeah. your wife helped pay for her wedding oh, ring yeah. too. Oh yeah, oh yeah, man. <laughs> and then uh, and then I also I needed a root canal like two weeks before we got married. I didn't have money for that, so I put that on care credit, which is like, oh, I super had, high interest. I had a care credit card. Yes, so I was you like, weren't living <laughs> if you didn't. Sorry, hon, I got to do that one too. And then I it was one other thing I can't remember what it was, but I'm like, I'm what what on earth? I'm coming to this marriage with like, so, so hence, man. I'm just very grateful that she, like, she never, yeah. not once, Cody, not once in our marriage has she ever tried to talk me out of something. Like, when it comes to, yeah, kind of that's, furthering that's our lives. That's good faith, you know? Crazy, right? Like, she's been incredibly supportive. I think it's so important to have a partner like that, just barely. So, I bought out my business partner in our hospitality business at the end of last year. And that was a major investment, you know? And I was like, so we got a HELOC on our house because we literally like we risked risked it all, you know, and it's worked out great. Uh, but that was scary. And I'm risk adverse because of my childhood. Right. Mm-hmm. So it's like that was a hard thing for me to do. And I'm so grateful now that it happened because it showed me like, oh, yeah, like I can totally do it, you know. Uh, but I told my wife, I was like, this is the biggest risk we've ever taken. She's like, no, it isn't. We moved to Houston with a six month old baby with no guarantee of anything. What are you talking about? Like this <laughs> this is this is not even a risk. Yeah. And and I needed that, you mm-hmm. know? And so it's so important to have that partner 
that can be with you through those things because I I don't know that I could have done it. I probably couldn't have done it if I didn't have that support and belief uh, from her, you know? So true. So true. That's like a whole it's like a whole separate discussion, right? On like I mean, our, our business wouldn't be where it's at, you know, without oh, yeah, without that, my wife. It's and definitely true for me. Just just I mean, oh man, there's just there's a lot to that that it was a lot of grind for a lot of years and she hung in there for all of it without any complaints. I, you know, and I'm sure you have very similar stories and I know yeah. a lot of my friends do. It's nice to go down memory lane. Cause I had really like, you don't forget about those failures. They just aren't relevant in your life anymore. Mm-hmm. So it's good to like check back in and be like, Oh yeah. Like that was met. Like that was bad. You know, mm-hmm. like we really failed a bunch and, and to be thankful for the lessons that that taught us. But I'm curious in your industry, what are you seeing as like the biggest fears people have now? Uh, now, obviously, we just had an election, so that probably creates some, some uh, and moves some of that fear because there's a stability standpoint there. We know what the next four years looks like. We've seen the four years before. Uh, but what are what are the things that people are struggling with right now, would you say, when it comes to their finances? Um, you know, we, we deal with a specific demographic of people, and they go through big transitions in their life, right? So whether you sell a business um, and and that you've spent your whole life building up and now you have to transition emotionally, financially, like there's a lot of moving pieces there, right? Well, that exists for that person that sells a business as well as for the person that transitions into retirement. Yeah. And so both of those people though are slowing down their excitement for growth, if that makes sense. Yeah, totally. So, So in other words, I would say the majority of the people that we deal with, uh, if they have a concern... It is, is the overall system going to break soon? And if it does, is there anything that we can do about it anyway? But that's a great point. Right. So yeah. so I think that is at the core of like a true concern. I think, I think most people are saying, I believe that long-term our economy continues to grow, which most likely means the stock market continues to grow, et cetera. The problem is, what if this is the one time yeah. that everything breaks? Yeah, what right? if this is 2008? So, so it's always, uh, there's some great books out there um, about emotions and money and, yeah. and history. And It was I, T. Harv Eker, The Secrets of the Millionaire Mind, that helped me understand how big of a role uh, emotion holds with finances. And that it was that book that taught me, like, because I didn't ever want to spend money. like, and I, And when I did, I felt sick. And what I, what I learned in reading that book is that I took away the joy of money because I never got to enjoy it. Because if I bought something I really wanted, my reaction was like, ugh. And so then what I'm telling the universe is like, I don't actually want more money because nothing good comes from it. Like, I feel gross when I spend it. And so I loved in his book, he has like, you have 10% for this and 10% for that and 10% for this. And I loved what that did for me emotionally to say like, okay, this segment of money. So like in our family budget, I have a budget. My wife has a budget. My kids have a budget. And then within there, it's like, you can do whatever you want to do. And you can feel good in those purchases because it's like, that's what it's for, you know? And you've got to be willing to get to a place of money where you feel good doing those things you want to do with it. Yeah. Yeah. And I, you, you know, I even, I even think about, this is kind of a funny one that comes up a lot is, um, and, and you kind of just said it, which is, uh, it actually doesn't matter. Hmm. So this isn't all the time, sure, but this is quite, I would say it's might be close to 50, 50, or even a majority of the people we work with that have, uh, it's very difficult to spend money. Right? Oh, I'm sure. Like, yeah. like they have, they are, they are really successful and have built a lot of wealth and they've done it like saving and sacrificing and working. Yeah. And, and so sometimes like to think that you just flip this switch and, and you're going to spend that money way easier said than done. Oh, a hundred percent. Well, it's because it's so mental. Totally. Right. Like even for me, so because I was so risk adverse, uh, when we had moved back to St. George, we had bought in a house for a hundred thousand dollars. Like when we moved back the first time, 98,000. So it was like, hell yeah. Like I can pay for that house no matter what. You know, I can work at McDonald's. I could pay the mortgage. I could sell shirts on the sidewalk. I could pay the mortgage. I think our mortgage is like $600. And so that was great. And we redid it. We made it awesome. It was 983 square feet. So it was me, my wife, our two kids, and two dogs. And my friend Andrew, you know Andrew Spainauer? 
Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So mm-hmm. Andrew was like, oh, we're going to build this house. We're going to go out here. We're going to build this house over in this area. And I was like, well, how much is the house going to be? And he tells me, I'm like, no way, dude. <laughs> like, no, no, thank you. And but then he got my my mind working on it. And what I realized, I had this epiphany of like, I mentally was was stunting all of my growth because I all that mattered to me was stability. Mm-hmm. And so that's all my focus was. So I, I was very stable, but I never allowed myself to want more. And the second that I opened up my mental capacity for like, I would like an, a bigger house. I would like my dream car. All of those things happen for me, but my work ethic never changed. Mm-hmm. I just shifted the way that I thought about things. And that was one of the most profound moments of my life to see how much it shifted by only just changing how I thought about it, not actually changing any of my behaviors or activities. Totally. And so, sometimes it takes takes being around the right people, right? A thousand to be, percent. To be yeah. thinking differently. Because right. I'm in the same boat, right? I, I want flexibility and I want security. Yeah. Like 100%. Those are the two things I want. And, and whereas like, you know, I, I still think back like in the middle of, of the, of the great recession, right. From, so from 2008 to 2010, that was the time to buy as much real estate as you possibly could. Yeah. Right. And I still remember in that moment, um, we bought our first house and we used a first time home buyer credit, which yeah. essentially made it so we didn't even have to put a down payment down. Yeah. Right? Cause you got like 13,500 uh-huh. at the time. I bought my first house during that time yeah. too. And, and so uh, but what was interesting is, uh, one of, one of my, one of my, uh, one of the friend one of, he's become one of my best friends and we met in college, him and his wife, but he's like on the other end, he's on the other end of growth and prosperity, like something that I needed in my life. Right? Yeah. And, and so we became close through college. Well, during that time, me and him and some other guys, we just started, we bought as much as we could during that time oh you did and then we even though you're just starting out yeah we did everything we could to figure out how to make it work just leveraged yep and i and i was even on the lower end right than than them um but then we just kept going and going and going and uh and and what was really fun is in the middle of covid uh we bought um we bought a building for about five and a half million and that was like our biggest purchase you've been doing it together all that time so for 11 years yep we've been going 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 all this time and uh and now we just we just closed on something like really really big and it's it's not if it was left up to me yeah i don't do any of that dude none of it none of it all of that is outside of my comfort zone yeah and but it's because of the right people around me that 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 are good at that that have that different mindset and that's what kind of forced a lot of these fun things. It's so, so true. Breck, my business partner, he, so he loves cars. I love cars too. I just would have never like done it for myself. But he pre-ordered the Corvette when it came out. And then because he's so crazy, he ordered two. Because then he, he ordered a white one. Then it, and then the convertible came out. He's like, oh, I want a red one. So so he orders two Corvettes that he couldn't pay for, right? <laughs> and so the first one comes and it's awesome. And then I see the white one. I was like, oh my and we're going to sell it is what we're going to do. We're going to sell the white one. And then I look at it. I was like, oh, man, like, I would love that. He's like, then have it. I was like, what? He's like, yeah, dude, just take that one. <laughs> and I was like, but I can't afford it. He was like, sure, you can. Like, the business will pay for him. We're good. You know, like, just do it. And I'm like, are you sure? He's like, yeah. And so we did. And it was fine. But I would have felt like it wasn't fine without him being like, yeah, just do it. I would have never done it. Ever. I would have just been like, that is out of, out of control. That is not responsible. It's ludicrous. Like, I'm never doing that thing. But he was just so nonchalant. And that was four years ago. He was right. It was fine. Yeah. You know, so yeah. you do need someone who's going to stretch you out. And that's what I was telling Cam today. And we're talking. What I found in doing this podcast is episode 78. Everyone who's really doing stuff is investing in their personal growth and also has spheres of influence that help progress them further. And, and what's so interesting about that is, is like, it's hard to watch in the sense of it actually creates a wider gap, you know, between the haves and the have nots, because once you have, if you're willing to reinvest and reinvest and reinvest, then even if you're both putting in the same amount of work, this person's getting so much further because you have accountability coaches and masterminds and these incredible groups. And so like in your example, you maybe would have never gotten a house and now you just closed on some big, huge project. And it all started from having those people who are willing to like, no, 
Tony, you can do it, you mm-hmm. know, and now look 11 years later what that turned into. Yeah. And it, and it um, you know, what's what's cool about it is I think about it and I'm like, is it is it just to have a bunch of money? No, not at all. Like, that's not that's not why we that's not why I do it. Sure. Right. What it means to me, though, is this is where that mind shift had to yeah. had to change for me. Um, I wanted more certainty. I wanted more yeah. flexibility. Yeah. So I just wanted, I almost just wanted it sooner. And this was kind of like a path. Yeah, it's like to freedom, it. basically. Yeah. It was straight up. I just wanted to be more, I, I wanted faster independence. Yeah. It wasn't about having a ton of money, right? That's, yeah. That, that's not the value that was deep in me. Sure. The value is just, I just don't want, I don't want anyone, I don't want to owe anyone anything. Well, it kind of goes back to what you said earlier that when you have that certain, when you get to that sweet spot that you're no longer like a slave to your money, that's when you can really do the things in life that you want to do. Totally. And when you're unburdened by the financial expectations and you just know that all of the, all of the things you have to do are covered and, and you're not going to have a month where it's like, oh, we may not make it. Then you, that's when you actually start living your life. Yeah. Because otherwise you're just, you're like a slave to your own life. For sure. For sure. Totally agree. Well, I don't know how we did this, but we're already over 60 minutes. That like <laughs> absolutely flew. I asked one question <laughs> <laughs> and it just flew by, but I don't want to uh, uh, take away from the listeners uh, their opportunity to learn a little bit quickly about your practice and who's the right person for you. And if someone has listened to this and it created intrigue for them or or they're in a place where they're ready to plan or maybe they haven't had someone they've worked with before, who is the ideal audience for you guys with your organization and how should they get in touch with you? Um, so, so typically we work with two main types of people, uh, both go through a similar transition in their life. So it's going to be like a, a business owner that sells their business okay. and they're just, they're asking themselves like, where do I go now? Like, this is everything yeah. I've known. Yeah, that's tough. And all of a sudden I have a lot of money, but I don't know what I'm even supposed to do. I don't know what I'm doing with my money. I don't know what to do. I don't know what I'm doing with my life next. Yeah. So we, we help people navigate that. Um, and then, but the same kind of core criteria exists when you retire, you've been doing the same thing over and over for tons of years. And then you make this switch and all of a sudden you got to figure out how to live life yeah. and how to deal with the money. Yeah. So those are the types of people that we deal with. That's your specialty. Um, do you work with people anywhere? Like, cause I got listeners all over. If they don't live in Utah or Southern Utah, can you still work with them? Or is your, is your, is your niche really down here in Southern Utah? Yeah, no. So we have, we have clients all over the country. Um, as long as you're cool with uh, virtual meetings, we can take care of it. One of the blessings of COVID. Seriously. You know, Seriously. totally transformed our business because our hospitality business, we have clients everywhere. And I don't know that they would have been open or willing to that engagement until everyone became so comfortable meeting over a screen. Yeah. You know, and also we had properties that are more local, but we'd meet with them like maybe once a quarter because you're driving to get to their property and things. But now we meet every two weeks because it's just like everyone's okay with it and everyone had to figure it out. Mm-hmm. You know, where before they'd have been like, I don't understand that stuff. I'm not doing it. Totally. Totally agree. Yep. Yeah, definitely one of the blessings. Well, Tony, thank you so much. I love today's conversation. It's like all of my passions. I think it was incredible. Uh, if people are listening and they want to get in touch with you, I don't think we gave a website or your email yet. Uh, so it's just www.statera, S-T-A-T-E-R-A, wealth.com. Okay. And then uh, I'll throw your, do you have a work email? Uh-huh. I'll throw that in the show notes. So if you're listening, you want to get in touch with Tony, just go down to the show notes. We'll have that for you. Uh, but again, I know you got to get your son's basketball game, but thanks for being here. I loved it. You bet. It was tons of fun. Thanks, man. All right, Mal, that's a wrap. Oh, hold on. I have to ask you one more question. Mal, are you still recording? Yeah, I'm good. <laughs> okay, we're back. I forgot. It was so good. I forgot to ask the second question <laughs> I'm supposed to ask. And I don't think I've ever let anyone leave without a- answering this question. Uh, but how do you define success? That's a good question. Uh, you know, I, I've had the, the, the fortunate reality to meet with like maybe thousands of people at, at different yeah, stages I mean, at of At this life. point, you're probably, yeah. And I number. get to find out, you know, what their successes and failures are and, you know, what matters to them. Um, and I think through all of that, I would, I would probably say, I, I've, I came across a quote recently that said, accepting or taking pleasure in what is. And it was the definition for satisfaction. Interesting. And, I like that. And it didn't say uh, accepting or taking pleasure in what will be or what was, right? It just is what is. Yeah, because those things aren't real. Yeah. What was already happened and what could be is not totally is, is not guaranteed. And so that is like my life goal is to just live right here and just to be 
content and happy with what is. I am far from there, Cody. But man, is that would that just be an amazing place? Yeah. To why live. is it so hard to be present? So hard. But it's so great, that would be my definition. It's a great place to be. Seriously? I love it. I'm glad I remembered to ask you. Okay. Thank okay. you so much. You bet.